Buckle up for this thought-provoking presentation from Dr. Ken Saban, Chief Scientist at Red Wire Space, one of this year's silver sponsors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ken Saban to the stage. Hi, everyone. So uh, uh, today, my uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about the gold rush as uh, an analogy for what we are experiencing here. I think it's important to do that because uh, it not only helps us understand the experience of what's happening now, this golden age, as was mentioned, but also it perhaps allows us to make some predictions about what's going to happen. So uh, with that. Um, so we talk about commercial space, we, and this is a, you hear this thrown around in this room, but uh, consider that if you walk outside this building, you catch somebody in the street, and you talk to them about commercial space, they are not thinking about the same thing you are. I'll bet you 99, better than 99% of the time, they're thinking about something totally different. That's indicative of where we are in this uh, timeline of doing work in space and moving forward. And I want you to consider that as we go through this presentation and understand that there were similar experiences for people in the past. And uh, when we talk about the gold rush, you'll have a better feel for that. Uh, two things I want to just sort of caveats I want to put out there. First of all, um, I'm going to talk about people from California. I'm a Californian. I was raised in California. My father and his father were from California. Um, I just want to do that because uh, when I make fun of people from California, I don't, think, I don't want you to think that I'm making fun of strangers. Um, I know these crazy people, and I'm one of them. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So the other is, I'm a chemist. And uh, my friend Jonathan Volk always makes fun of me for saying that. But in this particular case, I think it's important because chemists are, and I'm making this word up, analogists. We use analogies to design hypotheses and then we go out and test them. So we might see an experiment that works with lead, say, oh, we should probably try tin. That might also work. There's a hypothesis, and you go test it. So uh, doing what I'm doing here, an analogy to uh, what happened in the past of the gold rush, is not that far-fetched for someone like me. So uh, the gold rush. First of all, the people who participated in the gold rush were called Argonauts. That term, that they were termed that by the governor of the territory of California in 1849. And uh, people, it's, it comes from the old Greek, uh, an Argonaut was a person who went to find the Golden Fleece. And uh, this group, this motley crew right here, these four individuals, we're going to come back and talk about them a couple of times during the talk. But these are the types of people who participated in the gold rush. This picture was taken uh, near uh, Sacramento in uh, late 1849. So we'll come back to them. And first, though, I want to talk about the gold rush, just to give you a little background. So in January of 1848, a guy named James Marshall, who was a foreman at a job site in northern central California, was doing what he did every morning. He would walk out, look at the trench that the guys were digging in front of the mill where the water wheel was going to go, and he noticed something glittering in the water. And he reached down, picked it up, and it was a, sh a small golden pebble. Now. Um, he knew what gold was. It was money. Money was made of gold. Some money was made of gold at the time. But to find it in the stream, just like that, he, as the story goes, he put it on a rock, smashed it with another rock, and it flattened out. It was gold. It wasn't fool's gold. It was the real deal. He mentioned it to a couple of the guys at work that day, and he mentioned it to his boss, the guy who owned the mill, a guy named John Sutter. And John Sutter was not a brilliant man. And he said, let's just keep that a secret. Well, that didn't work out. Uh, the guys at the mill started taking longer and longer lunch breaks and then just did not show up altogether. It's hard for us to imagine what happened in California, but in uh, the winter of that the early part of 1848, there were 750 people in the city of San Francisco. By the end of 1850, there were over 21,000 people in the city of San Francisco. Ships would show up and people would totally abandon them. There was a ghost fleet in the harbor of San Francisco. Even military vessels, we were at war with Mexico. The territory was uh, being contested. 
And uh, the military had to give people long leaves of absence because they would otherwise just leave and never come back. Uh, one guy left for two months. And when he wandered back into San Francisco, he had a bunch of burlap sacks filled with 60 pounds of gold. That's almost 1,000 ounces. I think gold's going for like 1,900 or $1,000 an ounce. It's $2 million. So uh, needless to say, things went sideways in California during that period. Oh, by the way, uh, the guy in this picture in the bottom there, that's James Marshall. He's the one who found that pebble. And that structure he's standing in front of is Sutter's Mill. So you find gold in California, and uh, you want to tell your brother back in Pennsylvania to come on out, participate in this. There's gold on the ground. It was a surface uh, hit, a surface load, which means you didn't have to dig for it. It was on the surface. So how do you tell people? Well, there's no tweeting, no cell phones, not even telegraph at this point. So you wrote a letter, and you mailed that letter. And it had to go either all the way around the horn, or it went down to Panama or Nicaragua, and then was carried across the isthmus, and then picked up by another boat and taken up, months. And who was transporting that? And who would transport people and material during the gold rush? Well, it was this guy, for one. This is um, obviously a very familiar face to all of you. He was a very famous man in his time. That is Cornelius Vanderbilt. And he ran a shipping business going down and back up to California during the gold rush. He made about a million dollars a year in his time, which is about $26 million a year now in our dollars, and he did fairly well for himself. But that's how the message got across, and, and for the most part, how people got back and forth. So let's say that letter gets to the brother in Pennsylvania, and what is he going to do? He's reading this thing. First of all, it's you know brother Ezekiel out in California who is a nut job to go out there in the first place, and now he's saying they're finding gold. It's like you know what are you smoking? This is why Californians have a bad rap. Um, and he's telling them to sell everything. You're giving up your life. These are people who have probably not been more than 50 miles from where they were born. And he's saying, you've got to come 3,000 miles on what is an extremely treacherous journey to come out here and join me. So uh, people did it. Just to give you an idea of what travel was like, this is a tough thing. It was hard for me. This is the best I could do, so bear with me. The map on the left is the distance you could travel in a period of time in the 1830s and early 1840s. So for example, if you went from New York down to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, it would take you two weeks. This is the map on the left. If you wanted to get to Indianapolis, Indiana, that's where I'm from, center of the universe, that was four or five weeks. And you can see that after Missouri, there's nothing because there is no general timeline. These people are walking out into the wilderness. 1857, things have changed. You can see that getting from New York down to Jacksonville, you're doing that in three days. Getting to Indianapolis, you're doing that in two or three days. You can even see that getting out to California, it's only taken five weeks. So what happened? What was the difference? Well, Cornelius again, he was big on trains too. He was a transportation guy. And he developed a very strong infrastructure which allowed people to travel at least part of the way. Of course, the Transcontinental Railroad that went across the United States would have to wait till the Grant Administration, which was in the 18, late 1860s, but the beginnings were there. People were able to make that distance. So what is the analogy to our situation? Well, the cost of flying is coming down. I know these aren't great examples. Space shuttle was a multimedia transport versus something like Falcon, which is usually either or but the cost is coming down. It's becoming reasonable, and private citizens are starting to participate. What mo what's more? Who are the Vanderbilts of our age? Well, they're people who are in transportation and logistics and are applying their money and their efforts to these types of things. This, you know, Motley Crue right here, right? These are the guys to either more or less of an extent and with better or worse success rates, they're doing it. This is the future. So picks and shovels. Whatever anybody tells you, red wire sells picks and shovels. This is what we do. We're developing the hardware that enables work to be done in space, just as people had to do that here in California. Now, you may be like me, and you look at that, that picture on the right there, see that old guy with the beard and the funny hat and the pan and the donkey or mule, whatever, I'm not even sure what that is. That's what it looked like to uh, look for gold. But the reality is, it didn't. It looked like this. I don't know if you can see that, but it was an it, that, that is the American River, just downstream from where 
uh, Sutter's mill is. And you can see they have eviscerated that river, totally taken it apart. And they don't have heavy machinery. This is people power, literally horsepower, and water irrigation power. They changed that place. And that's how industry is. It is not a pretty thing. And for us, we not only have to take industry that on the ground is difficult, but translate into something space, it will be very different. We have to understand that it will not always be pretty. One thing, just look at the bottom of that picture. Way down at the bottom, you see a guy holding his daughter's hand, and she's holding a doll in her other hand. We are going to take our kids to space. We're going to take families. We're going to take our kids, and we'll have kids there. It is just a matter of time. That's part of being a human. Uh, think about the experience that young girl had. This isn't a special day like bring your daughter to work day. Every day was a bring your daughter to work day. There was no mandatory school. This is how she lived her life. Think about the experiences she had, the adventures. and She's wearing bloomers. It's hard to tell, but it's a perfect picture. This whole idea of picks and shovels is not new. The industries have grown up around us. Common industries that we interact with on a daily basis that on the side did other things through the space program. ILC Dover is a division of Playtex and they made spacesuits, still do. Uh, and there's other examples like that. This is a great picture, I love it. That's um, uh, Buzz Aldrin, that's the picture of Buzz Aldrin. But if you look really close, you can see Neil Armstrong's reflection in his visor there. Other ways that we derive value from this whole effort of picks and shovels and things that were designed for space are things like memory foam, mattresses. The first laptop computer was designed for a space shuttle mission. Uh, mylar and other super insulators and other outputs from getting into space like GPS have changed this world. My kids will never know the joy of printing out a map on the printer. Yeah. The steps to moving forward, and, and Arun had mentioned this in the last presentation, is that we're very early in the process. If you look at gold, getting gold out of the ground, the first step is, first step is prospecting, exploring. Then you go to development, where you know where the find the hit is, and you're going after it. And then the finals, where you're actually doing the mining. Same with pharma. You do discovery, process, and then you go to manufacturing. Where are we right now? Just as Arun alluded to, we are firmly entrenched in the prospecting space. That's just where it is. Um, I think things will develop quickly, but it's going to take some time to get there. So it is a gold mine. In some ways, it makes the picture of the American River look not so bad, right? I mean, look at that place. It's, uh, but as far as a prospecting facility, I think that is what it is, and it serves us well for that. I know a lot of people say, oh, the space station wasn't designed for manufacturing. That's fine. It was designed in a way that allows us to do the things we need to do now to get to that point. So I'm happy with it. Another analogy I want to give to you is the whole idea of a general store. So let's say we're in California and you need to go get something. There were people who made fortunes operating general stores. There's a guy named Sam Brennan who had a general store in San Francisco and one at Sutter's Mill. And he saw what happened. He was like, I'm going to capitalize on this, but I'm not going to go look for gold. I'm going to sell devices to all the people looking for gold. So we went into San Francisco. People had already been trading with him gold nuggets for picks and shovels out of his little store at Sutter's Mill. So we went into California, into San Francisco. He went to every general store in the city, bought every pick, every shovel, put them in his shop, and then he had a one-man parade where he waved a little bottle of gold that he had gotten from these guys, said, gold on the American River. Sam Brennan was making about $500 a month at the general store at Sutter's Mill before. In July of 1848, he made $12,000, okay? He became one of the wealthiest men in the state of California and one of the biggest landowners. This, is a, this right here, what you're looking at here, is a general store. It's a pick and shovel, but it's also a general store. This is a additive manufacturing machine that prints in ceramics and metals, like titanium. If you're on Mars, you're on, out there on an outpost and you need, you really need a part for, let's say, life support, what are you going to do? Call up NASA and have them ship it to you? You'd be dead by the time I got there. This thing will make it for you. So um, the gold, where is the gold? I'm going to tell you where the gold is. The gold is in crystal production. That's just one of the examples. And I believe that if done right, you can have extremely valuable products that are worthy of being done in space because they're better, bring them down. And this has been shown before in experiments like the Catruda study, which has been talked about, where they found that they could make not only new crystals, but ones, ones that have never been seen before, but were unique 
and ultimately could deliver better properties. And they were able to take those crystals, bring them down to the earth, and uh, use them as seeds in further studies. So that's the analogy. I think it's, it's real. The gold rush is on. We're seeing the beginnings of it. We're just missing the gold. But that is what Space Station affords us, a chance to find that gold. And once we do, the same thing that happened in California is going to happen in space, I believe. There's going to be no way to stop it. People are going to fight their way to get into space. And we can sit here and say that we were here and we saw it happening at Sutter's Mill. Thanks. <laughs>